Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Kate Quinn, and I am a unit chief here in the Queens District Attorney Melinda Katz's Domestic Violence Bureau. I've spent more than the last decade fighting for justice on behalf of survivors of domestic violence. And I am so thrilled to welcome you to the Queens DA's first ever Domestic Violence Awareness and Resources webinar. You are not alone. We are here to help. That is the message that DA Katz delivered to survivors of domestic violence when she promised to work collaboratively to keep victims and survivors safe. It's the message she delivered to survivors in the early days of the pandemic when she created a 24-hour domestic violence helpline, guaranteeing survivors access to an assistant district attorney 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that no one would ever have to feel alone and unsafe in their homes. It's the message we deliver to survivors every single day at the Family Justice Center here in Queens. And it's the message that I hope you take from this webinar. I am so grateful to DA Katz for giving me this opportunity to introduce you to some of the people fighting for survivors of domestic violence here in Queens County. I have to say it is a true team effort here at the Queens Family Justice Center. Home to the Domestic Violence Bureau of the Queens DA's office and run by the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, the Family Justice Center is a true one-stop shop for victims of domestic violence. And for the first half of this webinar, we will introduce you to some of the ADAs in the Domestic Violence Bureau to help you understand what happens if you or someone you love reports that they have been abused by an intimate partner. For the second half of this webinar, we'll introduce you to some of our community partners in the fight against domestic violence. Because we know that we cannot fight this battle alone, and we rely so heavily on our partnerships to keep victims and survivors of domestic violence in Queens County safe. And with that, I will turn it over to Ken Applebaum, our acting bureau chief, who has guided us through the challenges of the last year and helped us ensure that despite the challenges of the pandemic, domestic violence survivors in Queens County can feel safe in their homes. A graduate of Albany Law School, Ken has dedicated his career to prosecuting and supervising the prosecution of domestic violence cases, felony sex crimes, child abuse cases, homicide cases, and crimes against the elderly. And in addition to training new prosecutors in Queens, he has used his wealth of experience to conduct prosecution trainings with police and prosecutors in various other jurisdictions. We are grateful for his leadership. So Ken, if you could please take a moment to introduce our district attorney, the Queens District Attorney, Melinda Katz. Thank you, Mary Kate. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the person responsible for making this afternoon's event possible. She's someone who cares deeply about the borough of Queens and has spent much of her career in public service working to improve and protect the lives of Queens residents. DA Katz is the first woman elected to serve as district attorney of Queens and has established the first all women leadership team with chief executive assistant Jennifer Nyberg and chief of staff Camille Chinky Fat. Since taking office during an unprecedented time in 2020, the district attorney has led the office through a nationwide pandemic to ensure the safety of more than 2 million people who live and work in our borough. Among her year one accomplishments are the creation of the Conviction Integrity uh, Unit to restore justice to those wrongfully convicted, which is another Queen's first, and an enhanced community partnerships division to strengthen ties to the many communities that comprise the most diverse county in America. As Queen's DA, she brings a steady community-centered approach to this office while also helping to implement meaningful changes in the criminal justice system. Please join me in welcoming District Attorney Melinda Katz. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, am I heard? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'd like to be heard. So uh, first of all, Kenny, thank you, uh, uh, Chief Applebaum, for the work that you have done in taking the reins of the DV Bureau uh, and all that you've accomplished. And, and I want to note for everyone that is on this webinar, and I was taking a moment to look 
through those that are just attendees and are watching today. And I think that what I saw was, was quite amazing. Uh, you know, on this call here as participants, you have a lot of my uh, executive staff and my bureau chiefs, right? You got Jen Nyberg is the chief executive, is my chief assistant, uh, always comes through. Uh, Colleen Babb is, is also on the executive, she's an executive of community partnerships. Uh, you know, Audra Berman's the uh, deputy chief, Mary Kay Quinn is a great ADA. Um, and, but you know, also in an ADA, uh, you know, uh, Nicoletta um, Caffrey, animal abuse, but we also have listening a lot of the other bureaus and a lot of the other executives today who may not automatically have a DV case. You know, we have uh, Dan Saunders is on and Jessica Melton who does the human trafficking. We have Joe Connolly, Kristen Kane, Kathleen Williams. And I think it's amazing the interest that this webinar has had through the office because that's important. It's important that not only, you know, DV and those of us that do it and those of you that work in the area every day do it, but the interest has uh, gone across the office in any in all the other bureaus. Um, so I want to thank all of you for being a part of this, um, and welcome to our Domestic Violence Awareness uh, Resources uh, webinar. This month marks the National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, giving us an opportunity to connect with individuals and organizations, offering the support that many of you do here. And no one deserves to suffer the trauma of domestic violence intimate partner violence um, alone. And my office makes every effort to provide meaningful services with many of your organization's help to those that are trying to get through. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, we have seen an increase in the reporting of uh, domestic violence. And this is why as soon as the city and state lockdowns went into effect in 2020, I created the domestic violence helpline here in the office for those in need. And the helpline is 718-286-4410. It allows the caller to select the option of speaking to an ADA or a service provider. So even if you just want help and you don't want to prosecute, you don't want to get involved with the law, you can call up and simply ask for a service provider to help you. And you can do that 24 hours, no matter what, day or night. The, it is important that those who are suffering understand that they aren't alone. And too often, DV victims do feel that way. They're made to feel that way, as you all know. They're made to feel isolated. They're made to feel like they're alone. They're made to feel like no one's going to believe them. They're made to feel like law enforcement would never take them seriously. And I think that anyone that's gotten involved in our office knows that that's simply not true. That we do take uh, complaints seriously, and we understand how important our role is. There are a variety of resources available to help survivors to reclaim their lives. You'll first hear from legal ex experts from my Domestic Violence Bureau. The Bureau is dedicated to the investigation and prosecution of intimate partner violence. This includes harassment, assaults, violations of, order, of orders of protections, orders of protection, as well as cases involving strangulation, stalking, and attempted murder. The Bureau works closely with the Queens Family Justice Center and works to ensure that victims are connected to safety planning and also to counseling services, very important in a holistic approach to combat intimate partner abuse. Later on in the program, you'll also hear from a number of our partners uh, out of the Queens Family Justice Center, organizations that work with victims on a daily basis. They're all doing a great job and I'm proud we can help highlight their work and also the ongoing partnership. I would like to acknowledge Susan Jacob of the Queens Family Justice Center, Dale Carter from Safe Horizon, Danny Salim from, Salim from the Arab American Family Support Center, Rachel Levinson representing the council, Gahi uh, Fisher, Korean American Family Service, and Shanika White, Women's Prison. happy to have you at Family Justice Center. Thank you for being here. Our office is grateful to all the work that all of you do. You cannot prosecute your way out of domestic violence. You can't prosecute your way out of intimate violence. There has to be a safety net. There has to be that caring out there uh, and, and that caring, which leads to actual resources, not just a, a shoulder, which is always great, but resources and safety and empowerment of people getting out of those relationships. So I thank you very much. And ADA Quinn, Councilor Quinn, I turn it back to you. Thank you so much, DA Cass. Now at this point, 
in the webinar, it is my privilege to introduce you to some of the staff of the Queens District Attorney's Domestic Violence Bureau and to allow them to explain to you what it is that we do here on a daily basis. We wanna introduce you to this staff so that you can feel confident knowing that if you or someone you love reports that they have been abused by an intimate partner, the case will be handled by an ADA trained to truly understand the dynamics of power and control, the cycle of abuse, someone who understands the trauma associated with DV, the pressures you may face from family, friends, or your community, someone who will take the time to get to the root of the problem and provide support to keep you safe. So speaking of people who have been trained to understand the dynamics of domestic violence, let me introduce you to Audra Bierman, our Deputy Bureau Chief, who was appointed by DA Katz last year. Audra graduated from Fordham Law School and has been a career prosecutor ever since. She has been a domestic violence prosecutor for almost 15 years, prosecuting thousands of cases and bringing almost 50 misdemeanor and felony cases to trial. So Audra, let's kick this discussion off by having you explain what exactly happens if someone reports an incident of domestic violence and an arrest is made here in Queens County. Thank you so much, Mary Kate, and thank you to DA Katz for having such an informative um, information session. It's so, such an important topic. So I would like to tell you a little bit about what to expect when an individual is arrested um, from our office. You will be contacted within just a few hours from a member of our intake bureau. That person will gather information, allowing us to draft a complaint and have the defendant arraigned. At an arraignment, our office always asks for a full order of protection in domestic violence cases. However, there are times when that is not issued by the court. And so we have safety protocols in place where we will put you in contact with the Family Justice Center to help you in getting a family court order of protection if necessary. After arraignments, you can be expected to be contacted within just a few days from a specially trained domestic violence assistant district attorney. On occasion, that attorney may ask you to come into the office for an in-person meeting. However, most things can be done via phone and email now. The most important message that the ADA will convey is one that you're gonna hear a lot today, which is that you're not alone. We're here to help you in any way that we can. The ADA will offer to make a referral to you to the Family Justice Center, which you'll hear more about later in this presentation. Our number one priority for every survivor is their safety, and we strive to make that message clear every single day. The Assistant District Attorney will stay in contact with you as the case proceeds and discuss all possible resolutions, including but not limited to a plea, which could include probation, an abusive partner intervention program, mental health treatment or drug treatment, and in some certain circumstances, incarceration. Ultimately, if a resolution cannot be reached and a case proceeds to trial, that assistant district attorney who's been trained in trauma-informed interviewing techniques will help you through the process of a trial. As our esteemed district attorney mentioned in her remarks, we want you to know that we're here for you seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You don't have to go through it alone. We will work with you, the Family Justice Center, and the NYPD to keep you as safe as possible through these very challenging times. Now, Audra just mentioned how we work to keep our victims and survivors of domestic violence safe. And we work closely with our partners, including NYPD. So at this point, I'd like to direct a question back to Ken Applebaum, our acting bureau chief. Ken, could you explain NYPD's role and our relationship with NYPD, in particular, the domestic violence unit and domestic violence prevention officers in keeping DV survivors safe? We, we work very closely hand in hand with the NYPD officers involved in domestic violence arrests and prosecutions at really two levels of the police department. We work with the uh, domestic violence officers who are assigned to each of the precincts in Queens County, and they assist and supervise in every case, every arrest, every complaint that's made in Queens County. And we also deal at a higher level of the police department um, with the domestic violence unit, 
which is located in one police plaza. And we have very close ties with a lieutenant in the domestic violence unit there and a one-star police chief who have us on speed dial and we have them on speed dial and we're constantly in communication to smooth things along and make sure that things are done properly with the best possible outcome. Um, at the precinct level, um, the domestic violence officers <clears throat> in each precinct assist us in obtaining all the police documentation that we're gonna need at the very outset of a case for, for the grand jury or for any further court proceedings. They'll help get us the body camera footage from any and all of the police officers who responded to a complaint of domestic violence. And uh, the domestic incident reports that are taken at every uh, incident of a reported domestic violence incident, uh, arrest reports, any other paperwork uh, that's uh, attending the case that we're gonna need to review provide it to the defense as part of our discovery, discovery obligations and to assure that we're proceeding down the right path for any particular prosecution. Um, we also have a domestic violence officer who's assigned on site where we are at the Queens Family Justice Center. And this is a great benefit that we have. If someone uh, who doesn't have a case pending walks in off the street because they're aware of the work that we do here and they want to start describing an incident of uh, past domestic violence uh, that they've been the, the victim of. Uh, we have a domestic violence officer on site who can have a conversation with that person, take a report and not have to say, well, sorry, you're going to have to go back to the precinct where this happened. We can, we can get everything started here and we can uh, introduce them to prosecutors who will be involved in the case and to other partners at the Family Justice Center. Um, we meet uh, a couple of times a year. We invite all the DVOs, uh, supervisors and queens from all the precincts to our office here at the Family Justice Center and the lieutenant and the one-star chief from Police Plaza. And we spend you know, the better part of half a day uh, reviewing where we're having successes, where we're having difficulties, how we can continue to help each other uh, to assure the smooth sailing of all the domestic uh, violence prosecutions uh, that are coming through Queens County. Um, we also um, have um, a program that we occasionally become involved with domestic violence victims before an arrest is even made. Ordinarily, or, or many times, someone makes a 911 call reporting an incident of intimate partner abuse of domestic violence, and the police arrive, and they're able to uh, sort it out, make a prompt arrest, and the case proceeds through uh, the police department to our office and on through the court system. There are also many times when the perpetrator of the crime has fled the scene, is no, his whereabouts are or her whereabouts are unknown at the time the police respond and an investigation is launched to try and locate that person. During that time, domestic violence officers in each precinct will continue with a, with a certain regularity to make home visits to make sure that the, uh, the survivor of domestic violence is safe and that her needs are being met. And that's something that happens really in, is unique to domestic violence prosecutions and not so much in other areas of the law uh, that our off office encounters. Um, we also, uh, so on these cases where an arrest isn't made promptly on scene because the perpetrator isn't there, uh, we at times will make attempts to gather information from the survivor, collect evidence that might not be available if there's uh, a long wait between the time of the crime and the time of the arrest. We're able to uh, obtain crime scene evidence, photograph injuries that will have healed uh, and not be properly documented. If an arrest doesn't occur within a short period of time, we can preserve surveillance video uh, that may be relevant to helping us prove a domestic violence incident happened. Uh, we, we can preserve electronic communications between the party that, that corroborate and help us sustain um, our burden of proof when it comes to going to court. Um, also, uh, the domestic, the responding officers to an, an episode of domestic violence, intimate partner violence, uh, prepare routinely a document called the, a domestic incident report. And among the, the information they gather is they ask the survivor of domestic violence 
uh, for information of not only about what happened, but about the history between uh, the, the two people that are involved. And among the questions they ask is, does the person who perpetrated these acts uh, upon you have access to firearms? And at a surprisingly an alarming uh, rate, we sometimes be told, yes, there's guns in the apartment and this is where they're located. And so before an arrest is even made or promptly after an arrest is made, we work very closely with the police department to write a search warrant and, and obtain not only evidence, but firearms that could lead to an additional charge of uh, weapons possession. Um, the, when, we, when we meet with the domestic violence unit, uh, Lieutenant and, and Chief at One Police Plaza, it's more at a, of a systemic level where we're identifying things that systemically in our county uh, are either very helpful to us or causing us certain difficulties. And they're very enthusiastic about reducing friction in the process and helping uh, the officers involved and the DA's office uh, smoothly and as efficiently as possible navigate all the issues that, that attend a domestic violence crime. Um, they also send us uh, a high propensity list that they, that they gather of who they perceive uh, among uh, the defendants that they've encountered that they consider to be high risk, high propensity offenders. And together we review it and make sure we're all on the same page and hopefully to avoid anything falling through the cracks. Um, they're always willing to assist uh, with devoting precinct resources when an unanticipated emergency happens, something that needs a prompt response and that, and that needs to be cut through um, sometimes the bureaucracy rather quickly. And so we appreciate all their efforts and it, it's a great help to us and, and we strive to be as helpful to them as we can be. So Ken, I think you pointed out something that many people may not know, which is that the NYPD keeps a list, a high propensity list of defendants and domestic violence survivors that they deem to be most at risk, as well as a child at risk list. And those lists are sent to us to help us in our evaluation of a case. So that when we review a file, we're able to see whether NYPD has noticed any red flags or safety concerns. I'd like to turn this back to you, Audra. As someone familiar with risk assessment tools and their application to domestic violence cases, can you explain a little bit about risk analysis and how it applies to domestic violence? Sure. So once a file is received by our bureau, every single case is assessed by a supervisor using one of those risk assessment tools. The reason this analysis is done is because at times the case may seem less serious to an outside pair of eyes is actually an, it's an indicator of a much more dangerous situation. There are several factors that we consider. It's important to be on the lookout for it if you're trying to help a loved one or neighbor. And some of these factors, although this is not expansive, are controlling behaviors, isolation, not being able to see friends or family, monitoring someone's phones or whereabouts, stalking behavior, people showing up where you don't expect them when you never told them where you would be. Those are some of the signs of the controlling behavior that as a community we can be on the lookout for and that we are on the lookout for when assessing cases. Some of the factors that we actually consider that are in this assessment tool are, as Ken said, does the defendant have access to guns? Is there any history of strangulation? Is there a history of violating an order of protection? Is the abuse increasing, especially if someone's trying to leave the situation? As we know, that's the most dangerous time. Are there children in the home with a focus on, are the children not the defendants? That is another risk factor that we consider. Are there mental health or substance abuse issues? Was the survivor abused while they were pregnant? These are parts of this tool that we use and we actually get a number at the end of it to show us on a scale of how high the risk is for lethality um, on every case that we assess. Another factor is animal, animal abuse. Our district attorney, when she came into office, recognized animal, animal abuse as a risk factor in domestic violence cases, which is why she created the Animal Abuse Unit as part of our Domestic Violence Bureau. 
as I said, this list is not exhaustive, but many factors that we consider and you should be aware of when trying to help your loved ones and neighbors. Thank you, Audra. I think it's important for the community to know that in assessing these cases and conducting this risk analysis, there are also several programs that the office participates in to try to address these concerning risk factors for domestic violence. For example, uh, over the last year, under the leadership of DA Katz, we've joined with the Brooklyn DA's office, the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence, New York City Health and Hospitals, and Mount Sinai on the Strangulation Response Roundtable to try to come up with a system of best practices for domestic violence services, for domestic violence prosecutions where someone has been strangled. We try to come up with the best and safest approach for survivors of strangulation. Uh, so that's just one of the risk factors that we recognize and how we approach that. Audra also mentioned stalking as a domestic violence risk factor. And the Queens DA's office has partnered with NYPD and the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence on the CAPS stalking program. This is the coordinated approach to preventing stalking that makes sure that victims of stalking are given priority access to resources such as safety planning, including shelter placements and lock changes. And finally, one of the risk factors Audra mentioned that I don't think many people realize is the interplay between animal abuse and domestic violence. And some people may question why the Animal Cruelty Unit is part of the Domestic Violence Bureau. But what DA Katz recognized was that there is a nexus between domestic abuse and animal abuse, and that they often occur simultaneously within a family or relationship. Now, I'm not sure there's anyone in the state more qualified to explain this nexus than Nikki Kaferi the Chief of the Animal Cruelty Prosecutions Unit and Deputy Chief of the Domestic Violence Bureau in the Queens DA's office, where she has been an Assistant District Attorney since 1992. Nikki works closely with NYPD's Animal Cruelty Investigation Squad and the ASPCA in investigating and prosecuting crimes against animals. And for her work in prosecuting animal cruelty cases, Nikki was awarded the New York City Bar Association's Thomas E. Dewey Medal and the ASPCA Award of Excellence. She's also been named by the Animal League Defense Fund as one of America's top 10 animal defenders. Nikki, could you please explain for us this connection and the role of the Animal Cruelty Unit as it pertains to domestic violence? Yes, thanks so much, Mary Kate. And first, I want to thank District Attorney Katz for recognizing the link between domestic violence and animal cruelty and giving me the opportunity to work with the Domestic Violence Bureau in these highly charged, volatile, and dangerous and serious cases. Each year, approximately 1 million animals are abused and killed in the United States uh, in DV situations. 70% of DV victims with pets report their abuser had killed, harmed, or threatened to harm a beloved pet. Beloved pets are often the only source of joy and comfort in a very serious domestic violence situation. And the abuser is very smart to use pets as an effective tool of control and power. In this way, they can terrorize, isolate, silence, punish, retaliate and prevent their victims from leaving them. I certainly have had a number of cases where the defendant has threatened to kill uh, their uh, abused when uh, they threaten to leave. And when they do threaten to leave, they do kill the pet. Um, and this is a terrible situation and it does escalate the domestic violence in that particular home. So in light of this context, the initial stages of the DV cases, um, I find it is essential for the DVOs, the domestic violence officers, and the ADAs to be asking about pets in the household because our furry and not so furry friends, including goldfish and lizards and the like, um, are protected first by our legal system because it is a crime to harm kill, neglect, or abandon an animal. And so that will provide a separate charge altogether if that has occurred in the household. 
Um, it, so we want to add these additional charges in addition to whatever domestic violence, assault, harassment, stalking charges. Sometimes these charges are actually easier to prove because with the help of a forensic veterinarian and some other observations, we might be able to do so without the um, assistance of a reluctant um, domestic violence victim or survivor. In addition, in the beginning, we must include an animal in the orders of protection. We talked about orders of protections and our pre-printed forms for orders of protections have a box or a section uh, that includes companion animals, which are pets. And again, it's any kind of pet um, that will uh, act as a, as a companion animal. I always recommend that uh, these boxes be checked off whether or not the victim has indicated there is a pet in the household because at the beginning of the case there may not be one but during the case at some point the victim may acquire a pet and so that would then protect a newly acquired pet as well and why this is important is if there is a violation of that order of protection with respect to the pet in the household that too can form the basis for another criminal charge that's criminal contempt for the violation of the order of protection and so another tool that we have to prevent the abusers from carrying out some terrible plots um, also we wish to assist the DV victims and survivors in a safe exit plan uh, because at least half of domestic violence victims and survivors stay with their abuser for fear of a uh, pet being harmed if there's no exit plan that includes the pet. There is a new push for domestic violence shelters to become pet friendly. And in 2019, the Urban Resource Institute uh, actually had the first DV shelter that was pet friendly in the, in the entire country. And that is called uh, People and Animals Living Safely. And I would urge everyone in the community to continue to support uh, increasing these types of domestic violence shelters so that an abuse can leave with their pet and feel comfortable and not stay for fear that the pet will be harmed or killed. Um, but absent that pet friendly DV shelters, I mean, um, there should be an exit plan that's discussed early on and we do do that to um, provide for the pet for protection in an exit strategy, for example, a friend or a family member could take care of a pet. Um, the uh, victim who is looking to escape should have together all of the ownership documents that relate to the pet when and put it in a supply bag that will be available to them uh, when they are able to exit ship records, photographs, licenses, um, just so that they can prove that this is actually their pet because sometimes the abusers will claim, no, that's my pet, not her pet um, or his pet. So that is, that is also very, very important because um, if it is preventing someone from leaving uh, the dangerous situation, we want to make sure that that bar to leaving is, is removed. Um, a special note for children witnessing pet abuse. Unfortunately, if there are children in the household, uh, the DV victims in about 70% of the cases report that the children are witnessing that abuse. And this is important for a couple of reasons. First, children are developing their empathy skills at that time in their development. And we want them to, it's very helpful to have animals in the house to develop empathy skills, both for animals and for people. And we don't want to stunt that development by taking a hard line because it is so difficult for those children to watch an animal being abused. But secondly, and more importantly, we're all looking to break the cycle of, of abuse. Children mimic what adults do. And if they see 
daddy or mommy or whomever kick the dog, that is what they are going to do too and grow up and become abusers themselves, both maybe with intimate partners as well as with animals. And that is a cycle we wish to break early on. So we really must think about the children who are witnessing these events. Um, so in conclusion, I am going to just say it is so important to recognize that where animals are at risk, people are at risk, and where people are at risk, animals are at risk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, now, when we're talking about these red flags, these risk assessments, um, what we're really talking about is figuring out how to keep our survivors and victims of domestic violence safe. And we believe that part of keeping victims safe is holding offenders accountable. We are a bureau that's committed to stopping the cycle of domestic violence by addressing the root problems. And we do this by using alternatives to incarceration wherever possible. I'd like our next speaker, ADA Nicole Reed, who's one of our most experienced and senior felony ADAs to address that. Because in the years that we've worked together, I've seen just how thoughtful she is in investigating her cases and developing fair and just pleas that address the underlying issues. So let me tell you about Nicole. Nicole was born in Queens, New York to Jamaican parents. She's a graduate of Georgetown University Law Center where she earned her Juris Doctor in 2012. We actually met when she was in law school and interned in the Domestic Violence Bureau here in Queens. Prior to attending law school, she worked as a litigation legal assistant at the law firm of Wilkie, Farr and Gallagher in Manhattan. And she's joined us as a felony assistant for the last few years here in DBIG. Nicole. Could you please explain some of the alternative sentencing options that are available in domestic violence cases here in Queens County? Thank you, Mary Kate. Um, and thank you, DA Katz, for having this webinar today. Thank you for all who have joined. Um, here at the Queens DA's office, uh, when appropriate, we often refer and recommend defendants into programs as an alternative to incarceration. Specifically in the Domestic Violence Bureau, this is an attempt to break the cycle of violence and get defendants the help that they may need. When DA Katz took office, she developed and implemented a new bureau to enhance and expand restorative justice programs within the DA's office. She named this bureau the Rehabilitation Programs and Restorative Services Bureau and staffed it with internal alternative sentencing professionals who we consult with regularly to make sure we develop individualized treatment plans. She also appointed Aisha Green, who is a former DVADA, as its bureau chief. The Rehabilitation Programs and Restorative Services Bureau also consists of the Diversion and Alternative Sentencing Unit and the Crime Victims Advocate Program. Now, some of the programs that we use as a part of a defendant's treatment plan may include the Abusive Partners Intervention Program through the Fortune Society, which is a collaboration with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. That program provides court advocacy, individual case management, and group counseling services, and uses the dignity and respect and turning points curricula, which focus on the dynamics and effects of domestic violence. We also use the domestic violence interim probation, which is a specific form of probation. It's funded through the New York City Task Force, Domestic Violence Task Force. It utilizes evidence-based risk and needs assessments, individualized treatment plans, and incorporates participant accountability, and a required domestic violence offender intervention program. The domestic violence interim probation program is one year in length. We also use the PAC batterers intervention program, which views abuse and abusive relationships through a power and control model. They aim to teach new patterns of thoughts and behaviors using a nonviolent equity model for interpersonal relationships. TAS, Substance Abuse 
and mental health programs are utilized as well. And substance abuse encompasses uh, both drugs as well as alcohol. And we also use the Veterans Court and Mental Health Court programs as well. And there are times when we have cases that we specifically direct to Veterans Court and Mental Health Court. Veterans Court honors military service while ensuring that defendants receive comprehensive services. And Mental Health Court uh, addresses specific needs that defendants may have, have regarding their mental health. Um, so those are just a few of the options that we have for defendants as alternatives to incarceration that when we believe that it's necessary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. That brings us to our next speaker, our last speaker on the DA panel, Supervising ADA, Howard McCallum. Howard is a supervising attorney in the Domestic Violence Bureau and a graduate of Howard University School of Law. He has been an assistant district attorney in Queens County for the last 17 years and has worked in the Criminal Court Bureau, the Felony Trial Bureau, the Appeals Bureau, and now the Domestic Violence Bureau, where he recently became a supervisor, supervising both felony and misdemeanor ADAs in grand jury presentments, trials, hearings, strategy, and case analysis. And for the last several years, I have had the privilege of having the office next to Howard. And I can tell you that there truly is no better person to discuss the collaboration between our Bureau and the Family Justice Center partner agencies than Howard McCallum. Howard always has his survivor's needs at heart. So Howard, I will turn it over to you to describe for us your experience collaborating with the Family Justice Center partner agencies. Good afternoon, everybody. I wanna thank everybody for being here and thank DACAS for hosting this. When I first came to DV, the person who has a job I have now told me that the people across the hall, the social work side as we call them, would be indispensable in helping us prosecute our cases. And over the past couple of years, I've come to learn that to be true. On the DA side, we have the complainant's best interest at heart, but we don't have all the tools we need to help them with everything they need to be helped with. We can't help them with housing. If they're dependent on the, the abuser financially, we can't help them in that regard. If, they're, if they need the, the abuser for immigration, we can't help them in that regard as well. And it's an emotionally traumatizing experience when the person you love, the person, the father of your children, the person you're with is abusing you. And we are not equipped to help them deal with that trauma. But the people on the social work side are, are equipped to help them deal with that. I've had personal experience with them. I've had personal experience with them helping to safety plan for my complaining witnesses. I've had personal experience with them helping to obtain a divorce for somebody who was being abused by their husband. I've had personal experience with them, and this is very important because people come here and it's an emergency situation and they need to be placed in shelter. And Susan Jacobs is on, who's on this webinar as well, is amazing at that. People come here who need help and who, are to, who need to be placed in shelter. And Susan works some kind of magic to get them into the shelter they need to be get, gotten into to get them away from the abuser. People need help with child support and other, other incidences where they need help from the, from the, the abuser to, for, for, uh, for financial support. And the social work side helps them with that as well. And we are dependent upon them to make sure that we can prosecute these cases. If they have those fears allayed, then they can be more cooperative with us in the prosecution of the case. Because the last thing you want to you talk about is what happened when you can't get your bills paid, when your children are, are at home crying, when, you need to, when you're not safe, you can't focus on the prosecution of the case. And with the help of the social work side, Safe Horizons, um, Met Council, they, we, we, they help them feel safe feel secure, deal with their underlying human needs so we can help with the prosecution of the case. I have one particular story that sticks out for me about the help that I get from the social work side and that helped me with a particular case that I'm extremely proud of. There's a husband and wife, Juan and Cecilia. They have two children who are about five and seven years old. 
Cecilia realizes it's time to leave Juan and she separates. She's living in her apartment, Juan is living in his apartment. Juan repeatedly tries to get her back, but she repeatedly rebuffs his advances. One day, Juan waits outside of her house when she gets home from work and he stabs her repeatedly. Now, he's, he's on the run and we're speaking with NYPD detectives, we're speaking with ADAs in the bureau, with our, our bureau chief, trying to figure out what we're gonna do with this case. We call the hospital, she comes out of surgery, and we're trying to go to the hospital to try and speak to her, to try and enhance the case. It's myself, Jeffrey Boyce, who's the lead investigator in the DV Bureau, the two case detectives, and another male ADA. This case is big news in the FJC, so Susan Jacobs realizes there are five men going to the hospital to speak to this woman. So she assigns a, a person from Bosses Latina by the name of Sol to go with us to the hospital. When Sol and, when Sol and these, five, these five men get to the hospital, personally, I was amazed at how she reacted. She spoke to her in Spanish. She, she calmed her down. The main, the main interest she had was her children were with the babysitter when the, uh, when the attack happened and she wanted to know what happened with her children. Sol gave her the answers to that and, and calmed her down, translated for the police officers, translated for myself, and made sure we have the information we need to go forward with the prosecution of that case. When it was time to go into the grand jury, Sol was there for the preparation of the witness. When the witness had concerns about whether or not the defendant would make bail, Sol was there to, answer, to ask me the questions to relay the information to the, to the survivor. She went into the grand jury and we got an indictment on that case. The defendant is now serving 15 years for his actions and that would not have been possible without the help of Sol and the, and the social work side as we call them and Susan Jacobs. Two things that stand out for me were when she was in our, she was in our office being prepped for the grand jury and Met Council came in and gave her some, some, some food and a, a Target gift card and she broke down crying. That stands out for me. The second thing that stands out for me is that after the defendant had been sentenced, the two children came back for counseling on the social work side. And it was amazing for me to see the woman who was in the hospital on tubes and could barely talk was now flourishing with her children and recovering from what happened. And those two things stand out in my mind. We got the result that we thought was just and we help the victim and those two things combined together will work to show what we could do and what the social work side can do. And when we collaborate, we can achieve justice for these complainants. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Howard, um, for the wonderful example of what can be achieved when the District Attorney's Office Domestic Violence Bureau collaborates with our partner agencies here at the Family Justice Center. And that is the perfect segue into the second half of this webinar, where we'd like to focus on some of the partner agencies and highlight the tremendously important work that they do. Because we know, as Howard said, what we do means nothing without the other side of the Family Justice Center. So it is my absolute pleasure to start by introducing you to Susan Jacobs, the Executive Director of the New York City Family Justice Center here in Queens. I have to start with Susan because she is the one who brings us all together and keeps everything running smoothly here at the Queens Family Justice Center. She answers our calls any time of day. Whenever we are concerned about someone's safety, she listens and comes up with a solution. Susan changes lives every day with her take action approach. She has worked at the Queens Family Justice Center in various administrative capacities since 2008. And prior to her position with the mayor's office, Susan worked in the HIV and AIDS field for over 10 years in both New York City and India. In her current position, she manages the QFJC, which provides free and confidential assistance for victims and survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, including sexual violence, human trafficking, stalking and intimate partner violence. I think Howard put it best when he said, Susan works magic. 
Now, Susan, I know how dedicated you are to creating a diverse and collaborative based center here that can address the needs of domestic violence survivors here in Queens County. So could you please explain for us what the Queens Family Justice Center is and your specific vision for the center? Thank you. I don't know if I can follow this now. <laughs> that was incredibly powerful. Uh, thank you, first of all, to Queens DA Cats for hosting this very important event. Thank you, Kenny Audra, who I had the pleasure of presenting with last night, Paige, Howard, and Nicole, as we appreciate the strong partnership. And it is a true honor uh, to be here with my fellow colleagues, Dale, Danny, Jihei, Shanika, and Rachel. And thank you to a very important person, which is a survivor we will gladly hear from shortly. I'm so grateful to you as you show us why we do this work and you inspire me as well as many of the survivors who have the great privilege of meeting. You truly all inspire me. Um, it's, it's interesting that we're doing this virtual, um, but you know, I'm still getting used to this, but I can still feel the dynamic energy, even this virtual space because you all care so deeply for survivors just by being in the space. I know that we can make a difference and a special thank you to DA Cats who I had the pleasure of seeing last week because they donated lovely donations of new bedding and household items. Um, I was just bragging about you last night during our presentation because you know, we know that, um, I know that many of many of the folks here talked, talked about the extensive trauma that many of our survivors face. And we had a client who walked in the other day um, and he was, he's, ex, there's so much extensive uh, trauma and he walked in because we are going to be helping him with an apartment. And there are so many different wonderful people who are helping him and we would not be able to do this without everyone um and we were able to just walk over to the adas to our police officers and case managers who can help him and he said you know we also gave him this lovely bedding and household items donated by the da's office and da cats and he walked out feeling hopeful and he said people often give up on me and when he came in he felt truly helped and hope is such a powerful, powerful thing for many of the survivors. And this partnership that we have here at the Queens Family Justice Center, working with the DA's office and all the fantastic partners you'll be meeting shortly provides that for many of our survivors. Um, and um, a special thank you to Mary Kate, who is truly remarkable and always goes above and beyond for survivors. We would not be able to do this work without you. You are astounding and I'm so grateful to be working with you. Um, so the mayor's office to end domestic and gender violence, the family justice centers are located in every single borough and we provide support to survivors of domestic and gender-based violence and they can get connected to free and confidential testing, right? Uh, assistance. We are offering currently a hybrid model and communities can call the Queens Family Justice Center at 718-575-4545 and if we don't answer, please leave, leave a detailed message or you can call 311. And of course, the 24-hour domestic violence hotline is always available at 1-800-621-HOPE. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the Family Justice Center. And I know we have all of our fantastic partners. We'll be talking a little bit more about the services and I'll just be providing like a general um, overview of the Queens Family Justice Center. It's, so it's free and confidential assistance. Um, and domestic and gender-based violence can include sexual violence, human trafficking, stalking, and intimate partner violence. So, um, and anyone can walk in to get various different services, which includes safety planning, which we talked about. And the most important thing is before we start on the services, I just wanna say, um, we all are welcome regardless of language, income, gender identity, or immigration status. I get asked this all the time. So many survivors are afraid to come forward because of their immigration status. And we wanna make sure that everyone knows that we do not ask and there are immigration remedies for survivors of domestic violence and gender-based violence. So please, please call us. Um, 
And the Family Justice Center, again, we, you know, I mentioned safety planning, but it's also helping with public benefits, uh, shelter, which Howard talked about. And Howard, I remember that case. You are much too humble. You you worked tirelessly for survivors of domestic violence, and we're so grateful to you. So I just wanted to put in a plug for um, Howard when we were talking about shelter, housing, and other supportive services. We also, I know DA Katz mentioned this, how important mental health counseling services are. So we provide that here for not only the client, but also their children, because we talked so much about children who witness domestic violence. Um, information about job training, resume writing, referrals to educational programs. So legal help for orders of protection, custody, visitation, child support, divorce, housing and immigration. And of course, we work closely, which everyone mentioned about NYPD um, and the uh, district attorney's office. We also have child care for three and older. Um, and it's really, truly, truly remarkable. We've seen client, um, children who walked in and they won't say a word because they're so traumatized and they've just witnessed um, domestic violence, seeing the domestic violence and they walk in and once they go into the children's room and Luke, who is our amazing, amazing counselor on site, he is so wonderful with music. And so once he plays that guitar for the children, they walk out completely different people. And it's truly remarkable to uh, to see. So I wanna uh, thank Sanctuary Families Children's Program so do for doing such a fantastic job. So at the Family Justice Center, we have about over 22 partner agencies and they are truly, truly exceptional. And I know you're gonna meet many of the fantastic leaders who run these organizations and work at the Queens Family Justice Center because we would not be able to do this without their partnership. And I'm so excited because we've added um, new partner agencies that are here today as well, including Jihei Fisher from Korean American Family Service Center, Restore NYC, and they work with human trafficking survivors. And I know um, uh, we talked a lot about animal abuse and we are so excited because we actually have URI, Urban Resource Institute here on site. We have a lovely case manager who can also place clients and their pets in their shelters, which is really, really wonderful. Um, and many of our clients always walk in and they're like, what, you know, we can't, I can't leave because of my pet. So we have this amazing resources directly on site. We also have Women's Prison Association. Shanika is here. We're so happy that she works tirelessly each and every single day. We talk all the time because these are some complex cases and Shanika is truly outstanding and we're so happy to have her on site. And uh, Greenwich House, which just started, we just uh, developed this new partnership two weeks ago um, and Greenwich House offers um, holistic counseling services, which is truly, really remarkable. They have a music program. So they really do a holistic program um, and it's truly wonderful. And I know we're gonna get to hear from some of these uh, fantastic providers. And um, um, before I close, I just wanna tell all survivors of domestic and gender-based violence that we are here for you. So please, please do call the Family Justice Center. And um, we so appreciate um, all that all the providers do. And thank you so much. Thank you for letting us be part of this as well. And thank you to the DA's office again. And thank you so much, Susan. <clears throat> now, I wanna move on to Dale Carter, who's someone else who is just so integral to the success of the Queens Family Justice Center. From the time I started in the DA's office, Dale was already here, providing support, counseling, safety planning, and handling some of the most high-risk cases. I do not think it's possible to say the number of lives that Dale has changed or the number of survivors that she has helped. Dale Carter is the Safe Horizon Director of both the Queens Criminal Court Reception Center Program and the Queens Family Justice Center. In her current position at the QFJC, QCCP, she manages Safe Horizon staff, programs, and services, including confidential assistance for victims and survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, sexual violence, human trafficking, stalking, intimate partner, family violence, and all crime victims. 
She's been working at Safe Horizon in various positions since 2008. So Dale, uh, could you please explain for us Safe Horizon's role at the Queens Family Justice Center as you're one of our largest partners here? Thank you, Mary Kate, and hi everyone. And I just wanna thank the uh, DA Katz and the Domestic Violence Bureau for inviting me to this panel. Um, so Safe Horizon, again, we're located in all five boroughs, but here at the Queens Family Justice Center, like Susan said, right now we're working a blended schedule of on-site and remote work. So we have Safe Horizon case managers that will either answer the phones or if clients walk into the Family Justice Center, they'll touch base with them, they'll gather basic demographic information, and then they'll, they'll connect them to a case manager. A Safe Horizon case manager will either reach out to them or you know, work with them on site and they will do a safety plan. So the most important thing that a Safe Horizon case manager will do with our clients, if, if they get nothing else, they will do a safety assessment and a safety plan um, for that client. So after they do a safety assessment on, and a safety plan, they'll find out what brought them in, what services are they looking for? Once they, get, they do that assessment, they'll connect them for services on site here or remotely. And like Susan said, there's so many services. I mean, she, she, she said, you know, she said a lot. I mean, we, we have 18B attorneys that help with orders of protection, with family court orders of protections. We have the children's counseling, the individual counseling, um, shelter placement, lock change. I mean, I could go on and on. There's so many services. And if we don't have it on site here, Susan will find it for us. <laughs> um, and so we also have case managers. And like Susan said, we see intimate partner, we see trafficking, elder, uh, elder abuse, but we also see family violence. And in those instances, we have case managers in Safe Horizon case managers in the criminal court that see all crime victims. So again, and they're doing the same exact thing where they're doing safety assessment, safety planning, and they're you know referring clients for services. If clients need to get connected to services, they all they need to do is call 718-575-4545, or they can call the Safe Horizon domestic violence hotline at 1-800-621-467. It's a 24 hour hotline, it's confidential. They'll reach a live person and they'll connect them to services. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Dale. I do just wanna follow up with you on one thing. I believe that you also work with the Family Justice Center frontline staff to make sure that after a screening, each DV survivor is paired with a case manager who's specifically trained to address their needs and who understands any culturally specific concerns they may have. Could you explain just a little bit about that process of how people are paired up? Sure. So when a client comes in, and again, because Queens is such a diverse borough, we have case managers that speaks like several different languages. So if we have a client that came in and she, spe she speaks Bangla, we have a case manager that we know with Arab, Arab American that we can call and call that case manager and say, we have this client, they speak Bangla, they would feel more comfortable working with you and then we can make that connection. Um, so it's just the case managers, they are trained to know like when these clients come in and they ask certain questions, do you feel comfortable working with a, a female? Do you feel comfortable working with a male? You know, what language do you speak? So they're just trained to just be asked specific questions in order to connect those clients to the appropriate case manager. Thank you so much, Dale. And one of the things that really makes the Family Justice Center so special is the diversity of the organizations that are here. Um, so we want to introduce you to some of the additional partners that we have here at the Queens Family Justice Center. So I want to start with the Korean American Family Service Center, which is represented here today by Jihae Fisher. Jihae returned to the Korean American Family Service Center in April of 2019 as the executive director after having formerly served as the Director of Programs and Administration from 2012 to 2015. As a person of color working in an immigrant-led and immigrant-serving organization, she has a deep understanding of the many barriers and challenges the Asian American community is faced with in daily life. She has firsthand experience in teaching and coordinating workforce development classes and helping women register for skills training classes and finding employment. The Korean American Family Service Center has a long-standing relationship with DA Katz, and we are thrilled that Ji Hae and the center is joining the Family Justice Center as an on-site partner. 
So I'd like to turn it over to you, Jihei, to explain for us a little bit about what the Korean American Family Service Center does. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Kate, and thank you so much, DA Katz and her team for providing this important space. Hi, my name is Jihei Fisher, the Executive Director of the Korean American Family Service Center, also known as KAFSC. And we provide um, social services to those who are affected by domestic violence, gender-based violence. And we provide culturally and linguistically sensitive services to the community for 32 years. And we have developed best practices and expertise in serving the many existing cultural nuances, nuances that are barriers to seeking help and use tools and techniques that are culturally appropriate and most relevant to Asian immigrant survivors of gender-based violence, including domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, and child abuse. Although all our services are available to, to all, regardless of their ethnic background, we target underserved uh, the Korean Asian community in the greater New York area. With um, domestic and gender-based violence so prevalent in our community, and with the Asian cultural facing culturally unique barriers, there is a great need for the provision of culturally and linguistically sensitive service that we provide. Very, various cultural factors and barriers um, complicate addressing and eliminating the widespread presence of domestic domestic violence within the Asian community. For example, voicing abuse um, jeopardizes the harmony of the, uh, of the nuclear and extended family community and other groups involved. Those are some of the beliefs that a lot of Asian American survivors um, have. Um, and also AAPI communities consider violence inside the family as a personal issue rather than the community's issue to consider seriously. In Asian culture, particularly in Korean culture, receiving counseling, mental health counseling, is viewed as something utilized by those who are mentally ill, weak, or severely helpless, um, and have negative ta taboo um, feelings um, that are attached to receiving counseling. Additionally, traditional um, Asian societal values are family group oriented, suppression of emotions, authoritarian orientation, and emphasis on interpersonal relationship. For all these reasons, many Asian American survivors would rather suffer in silence than seek help and cause disharmony and negative precautions upon their children and family. But we are unique in it its accessibility to immigrant AAPI survivors on several points. So KFSC has both an English and a Korean name, which makes it readily identi identifiable to Korean speakers. Our website hotline and office phone provide information in bilingual or based in Flushing, Queens, uh, familiar area and easy to navigate for Asians, many Asians. In addition, for those who come to our doors, individuals feel a sense of immediate cultural connection to our bilingual, bicultural staff. Whether on the phone, web, in person, or utilizing our services, the immigrant survivors we serve sense that they can be understood and will be related to within their cultural context. And we're very thankful for our partnership with the Queen's Family Justice Center. We also have a case manager on site um, um, helping our immigrant survivors. And we also learn and collect a lot of um, really valuable resources from Queen's Family Justice Center. Thank you. Thank you so much. I also want to talk about our office's collaboration with the Arab American Family Support Center, another one of our on-site partners who have helped some of our most high-risk domestic violence survivors. The Arab American Family Support Center is represented on the webinar today by Danny Saloon, the Senior Director of the Solution-Based Casework at the Arab American Family Support Center, where he has served New York City's diverse communities since 2013. A graduate of Eastern Mennonite University with a master's in conflict transformation, 
Mr. Salim has vast experience in trauma healing and resilience, restorative justice, women and youth empowerment, human rights, and culturally sensitive programming. I'm proud of the collaboration that we have with the Arab American Family Support Center, and I would love for Mr. Salim to explain the work that the center does. Thank you so much, Mary Kate. Thank you so much for having us. And we're proud of our partnership with the Mayor's Office, the Family Justice Centers, and the uh, Queens District Attorney Office as well. So at the Arab American Family Support Center, we, uh, we provide drawn up services for survivors of domestic violence, as well as uh, the Arab Muslim and South Asian communities. So we have, been, we have had specialties in working with the Arab Muslim and South Asian communities. Our doors are open to all. And um, our staff speak over 27 languages. We've had our partnership with the mayor's office to combat gender and domestic violence since 2010. And through this partnership, we have expanded our presence into the five boroughs throughout New York City. And through this partnership, what we do is really we tap on into the services provided at the Family Justice Center in uh, providing one-stop shop for the survivors and mainly the legal consultations, which is heavily needed through our communities. And in addition to that, we provide our expertise in helping survivors navigate the cultural complexities, and especially when it comes to the stigma around uh, domestic violence and seeking help. So, and at the, fam at the Arab American Family Support Center, our, we provide multiple services, including domestic violence and child welfare, as well as uh, mental health services and immigration services. So through, through, this, uh, through our work at the Arab American Family Support Center, we provide our, our domestic violence and our child welfare program work hand in hand. And through this partnership and through this collaboration, we make sure the survivors that are sometimes have to deal with ACS are provided with the information they need, are advocated for. And also we make sure that we are working with the whole family as, un as unit when the case comes to us with the survivor approval and was taking, taking into account the trauma and the history of abuse, as well as the cultural piece and, and helping the survivor navigate these cultural challenges and the cultural limitations, as well as understand the process and learn about their rights. So also what we have done at the Arab American Family Support Center, we have also established a new uh, initiative, including the restorative justice, to make sure that the survivors are provided with multiple options. So meeting them where they at, as, as well as making sure that they are aware of what the process is, what the legal system is, as well as that they have multiple options on uh, they, they could, they could uh, work with. So I uh, appreciate all the partnerships and uh, at the Queens Family Justice Center, we have three case managers that speak multiple languages as well. Thank you so much for that. Um, so the case managers that you mentioned at the Family Justice Center are actually right down the hall from me. And next to them is our next speaker, Rachel Levinson of Met Council, who also shares our hallway. Rachel is a social worker at Met Council's Family Violence Program. She obtained her MSW from Turo College Graduate School of Social Work and has been working at Met Council for the last four years. Through Met Council's Family Violence Program, Rachel works with clients of varying ages, ethnicities, cultures, and religions, providing them with comprehensive case management services, safety planning, and trauma-informed psychotherapy to Queens residents struggling with domestic violence. And in addition to her role working with clients, Rachel is a supervisor to social work graduate students who are completing internships at Met Council's Family Violence Program. I've worked with Rachel and I know she feels passionately about working with survivors of domestic violence and helping them obtain safety and move forward in their healing process. Rachel, could you tell us a little bit more about the incredibly important work that Met Council does? I'd love to, thank you, Mary Kate. Um, and I also just wanna say um, the Family Justice Center, I know that Howard brought up the trauma that the victims are dealing with. Having a one-stop shop like the Family Justice Center is so incredibly important for victims dealing with this trauma 
not to have to go to 15 different office buildings to get what they need. And I really wanna stress that because that's what all of us case managers and therapists are talking about, right? This is all in one space. Um, so the Family Violence Program at Met Council is one of the only programs in the city that offers comprehensive case management services, trauma-informed individual psychotherapy and support groups, which we run also at the Family Justice Center, um, financial assistance and food assistance, as well as food stamps enrollment under one roof. Um, one of the factors that makes Met Council unique is that all of the workers on our team are licensed clinicians and we provide trauma-informed psychotherapy in addition to providing case management to our clients. Um, our program is also unique in that we offer urgently needed financial assistance to survivors who are in immediate danger. So we can quickly help them get to safety. Um, and the collaboration we have with the Family Justice Centers is so incredibly important um, the relationship we have with the DA's office, with Susan, Susan will call us and say, we have a client, she needs to get out, she's really, really unsafe. We can make it happen in the same day in sort of certain circumstances, which is very, very unique, um, as most people are aware. Um, while Met Council's Family Violence Program works with all New Yorkers, no matter what race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, however, we have a specialty in working with the Jewish community. Um, we're the only agency in the city that has both a special understanding of domestic violence in the Jewish community and can also provide that case management and psychotherapy in addition to financial assistance to our Jewish survivors. Um, during the pandemic, Met Council's program has expanded our helpline hours from a traditional nine to five model operating daily from 8 a.m. to midnight instead. And we have expanded our helpline to include Sundays as well. And we launched a secure text line as we recognize that there are many survivors who have been trapped in their homes with their abusive partners and cannot necessarily safely speak on the phone. Our number one priority when working with clients is to ensure their safety, ensure they have a safety plan, lead them towards a path of sustainability. Um, and when they reach out for help, they'll get connected to a case manager. We will assess their needs. Um, I have been working in partnership with the Queens FJC for the last four years. Um, and most of my clients are Queens clients. However, we have uh, members on our team who work with clients from all boroughs. Um, we have several languages that we speak as well. Um, and we have a trafficking expert on our team as well. Um, so it's been really a pleasure to, to partner with both the Family Justice Center and the DA's office. The work everyone does is so incredible. Um, and thank, I really wanna thank DA Katz and everyone here today. Thank you, Rachel. And finally, I want to introduce one of the newest partners at the Queens Family Justice Center, the Women's Prisons Association, WPA, who are represented here today by the incredible Shanika White. Shanika is a senior case manager with the Women's Prison Association, where she has worked for the last two and a half years while pursuing her bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Shanika works tirelessly on cases involving domestic violence survivors experiencing complex trauma. And she is committed to helping women achieve freedom, safety, and independence. Prior to joining WPA, Shanika worked with New York City's homeless population. Shanika, could you please introduce the community to our newest partner, the Women's Prison Association, and explain the important work that your organization does? Yes, hello, thank you, thank you. Um, hi, hello everyone. Um, well, Women's Prison Association works with female identified folks who have any past involvement in the criminal justice, the criminal legal system and or current dealing with open cases and or detained at Rikers or incarcerated in prison. Many of the people we work with have um, been criminalized in their survival. Um, we have a variety of programming um, within this agency, which is an educational and workforce development program. We have um, re-entry mentors. We have um, alternative to incarceration programming, which include programming um, for survivors of sex trafficking. We have prison-based services for people with HIV and Hep C up in Bedford and Taconic. Uh, we deal with civil family court legal assistance and the program that um, I am in, which is CLUE, which is a community-based um, services of helping um, women um, from legal services to just getting their ID, getting therapy, um, you name it, we can link them to it. 
And I definitely want to say thank you to Susan Jacob because I'm always on her line. She's like on my speed dial of like assistance, no problem. She has never told me no as of yet. And she's currently actually helping me with a client who has um, issues with getting her ID. She's 32, she's never had an ID. She's never had like a birth certificate social in her possession. And it's been very hard. I've been hitting a lot of walls and um, Susan and Queens Family Justice Center has been a very big help in helping me do this. So I wanna say thank you, thank you for giving us the platform and having us collaborate with you. And thank you for having WPA here today on this panel. Thank you so much, Shanika. And I truly hope that this introduction to some of our partners at the Queens Family Justice Center has been encouraging to the community and to everyone on this webinar. I think when you hear these stories and when you see the people, when you see the team of people who are waiting to help you at the Family Justice Center, I hope that anyone on this webinar can take some comfort and feel encouraged by that. We have a diverse group of trained, passionate advocates who work hand in hand with us to make sure that we do everything we can to keep our survivors of domestic violence safe. I want to now turn it over to one of our ADAs, Paige Nyer. Uh, Paige is another one of the most senior felony ADAs here in the Domestic Violence Bureau. She went to law school at CUNY Law and started with the Queens DA's office in 2013. Her first job out of law school and what she describes as her dream job since grade school. In 2019, she returned to the Domestic Violence Bureau as a felony ADA, where she has been seeking justice for and advocating on behalf of domestic violence survivors ever since. I have to say that Paige is one of our most passionate advocates. She is truly committed to fighting for justice for her survivors. So Paige and our next speaker will be able to tell you firsthand their experience and how the collaboration between DA Katz's Domestic Violence Bureau, the Crime Victims Advocates Project of the Queens DA's Office and the Family Justice Center partner agencies can truly change lives. So Paige. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, MK. And thank you everyone who's present. And thank you, DA Katz, for hosting this webinar and making sure all of our survivors have access to the best, best resources. Sitting next to me today, right now off camera, is an incredible woman and survivor of domestic violence. I am so honored, so honored to introduce you to her. She survived a brutal physical assault at her boyfriend's hands. She had the courage to leave him and to cooperate with the police and with our office. She remained strong and more courageous than ever when in violation of a full order of protection, her ex-boyfriend went to her home and fired bullets into her neighbor's car. Her neighbor's car was parked in her driveway and the defendant assumed it, was, it belonged to a male visitor of hers. The shooting was caught on video surveillance and this survivor was terrified, but she acted fearlessly. She acted fearlessly when she identified the shooter in that video as her ex-boyfriend. And even after the defendant threatened to kill her if she cooperated with the district attorney's office, she testified against him. It was because of this survivor's bravery that we were able to secure a conviction and that this defendant is currently incarcerated. And it's because of the amazing work of New Destiny Housing that this survivor now has a new lease on life. Literally, she has a new lease on life because she is currently in the final stages of relocation. So now when the defendant is released from jail, she will be living somewhere unknown to him. He will not know where she is and she will have that peace of mind. None of this, absolutely none of this would be possible if it wasn't for Ju Susan Jacobs who moves mountains. The strong collaboration between the Queens Family Justice Center and the Queens County District Attorney's Office's Crime Victims Advocates Program. So thank you all for your hard work. And I'm now going to let you hear 
a little bit from this survivor who's going to share her experience. She will remain off, off the video, but you will hear from her now. Hello, I hope everybody can hear me. I wanna thank everyone. That's what I wanna say foremost. And I wanna say my experience, it was, at first it was like scary. And then speaking to Miss Page, and then she um, basically introduced me to the family justice system. And that's when Susan was able to talk to New Destiny Housing. And my experience with all that is that at first I was scared out because my current situ the situation I was in, he used to say, nobody's not going to help you. And you're not going to be able, once oh, I'm out. Do you want to move a little bit closer? I'll turn the video off. He used to say, he basically, sorry, I was moving into the center of the, of the camera. Basically, he used to say nobody was going to help me. He said, once this is over, nobody's not going to help me. They're going to forget about you. But with Paige and Susan and the family justice system and everyone, I was able to gain my confidence. They helped me to find a place, and I was able to get a counselor from Safe Horizon. I was able to speak to them and they were able to get me an apartment. They just right now, just I guess fixing it up. <laughs> I'm kind of nervous, so sorry. And talk a little bit louder. I'm kind of I'm kind of nervous. I'm sorry. And I would say the experience was it was like really good because even they, they helping me with credit too, because with my situation I couldn't even get any credit because it was like that person always took my money and everything. So I just, I just didn't have basically a life. So after this whole experience with Paige and the district attorney and Susan and New um, Safe Horizon and New Destiny, now it's like, I'm getting my life back. I feel like the old person that I was before is coming back. So it's like, now it's like everything is put together. I feel safe. I was able to talk to counselors and they always, I had counselors. It was every other Wednesday. So, and I always, and they always make sure I was okay. Even with New Destiny Housing, they gave me a case manager. She also gave me a number two New York City, um, I think awareness or something or wealth to always like call. So, it had been very interesting. It, it was hard at first, very hard, because I was just, I thought I was stuck. I'm always a person who always deal with my problems alone. So I thought this was like another situation that I had to deal with myself and just try to be strong. But having help, I realized like I could finally have help. I'm not alone. And usually I'm always that person who keeps strong and keep everything bottled up. So having this team behind me helping me made me realize like, wow, I'm getting help finally. I'm not alone. Because I know with this experience, I used to feel like being a domestic violence, um, <laughs> sorry, being a domestic violence, like going through it, I used to basically feel like I was, you know, dumb or probably alone and I used to be embarrassed because nobody wants to come to tell somebody like they've been abused so I was able to face everything because I never dealt with something you know you hear it in the you hear it in the news you see it on tv but to actually happen to you is like difficult so it's like everything was awful but I'm happy that with the team and the family justice system, Paige, DA, and New Destiny Housing, I was able to get my life and feel like I'm not alone. Because I used to feel like, oh, I'm stupid. I should have never went back. I should have never did this. Or I should have never trusted that person. But they gave me the confidence to say it's not my fault. So that made me feel good to feel like it's not my fault because I always used to feel it was my fault for always coming back. And then to finally step up and testify and not be afraid anymore, it felt good. 
because it felt like I got my voice back and it taught me not to tolerate nothing from anybody and to always know that I could always call and I know I will get help. So that's what I wanted to say and I really do thank all of y'all for your help. Because if I didn't have no help, I would have been by myself or probably would still been with that person. So I want to say thank you. You are amazing. Thank, thank you. you. I do want to say thank you so much to Paige and also to our incredible survivor. Um, hearing you speak just now, it, it truly is a reminder of why we all do what we do and what is possible when we collaborate and work together. And to hear you say that you felt alone or embarrassed and you don't feel that way anymore, it means everything to us. To hear you say that you know it's not your fault and that you didn't deserve to be abused, that no one deserves to be abused by a loved one, it means so much to us. To hear you say you feel safe and you're beginning a new life, that is everything. And you know, you used the words that DA Katz has been delivering to survivors since she took office, that you know you're not alone. That's what we want people to know. That's what we want people to take from this webinar. You're not alone. We are here to help. The Family Justice Center is here to help. And I just am so grateful that you shared your story and your experience with us. It has been our honor to work with you. I also was just given notice that we do have a special guest joining this webinar that I want to introduce, Becca Wheeler from the Shalom Task Force. Now, Ms. Wheeler is going to uh, take a few moments to discuss with you some additional resources that are available for survivors of domestic violence. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm the Associate Director of the Hotline at Shalom Task Force. We're an agency that serves everyone, um, but we primarily get callers from the Orthodox Jewish community from all around the globe. Um, the majority of them are in the New York metropolitan area. Um, at Shalom Task Force, we have um, a hotline, a chat line, direct pro bono legal services, as well as um, education and prevention programs that go into schools across the country um, in order to best uh, provide our message across a range of spectrums. Um, these services uh, work in direct conjunction with some of the family justice centers as we have attorneys located um, at the Queens location and we're currently expanding our legal services to, um, out into New Jersey. Um, and at Shalom uh, Task Force, our organization has been around for almost 30 years um, and we've seen this work uh, grow um, and we've seen the different ways that we've been able to um, both uh, provide prevention services and direct services to our clients. Um, it's been a really wonderful thing being a part of the, the bigger domestic violence community and all working together uh, to make an impact and to show people that they are not alone and convey the messages that the brave survivor was able to share with us as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. And I want to just thank everyone again as we close out this webinar. I hope that everyone listening um, got something out of this webinar because it is so important for us that people know that they do not need to suffer in violence. We know that too often domestic violence survivors feel the way our survivor mentioned, isolated, incapable of independence, and that does not have to be your reality. We hope that if you are a survivor of domestic violence or someone you love is being abused by an intimate partner, that you've heard something here today um, that will prompt you to take advantage of these resources, to come to the Family Justice Center, to take advantage of the resources that are here to help survivors reclaim their lives. Uh, so we are so grateful to everyone who was on this panel, uh, to everyone who joined us again, Susan Jacob, Dale Carter, Danny Salim, Rachel Levinson, Jihei Fisher, Shanika White, and Becca Wheeler. We are so grateful and proud to call you our partners in the fight against domestic violence here in Queens. We know that combating domestic violence takes all of us. 
and we encourage everyone on this webinar to take advantage of the resources that were shared with you. We hope that you hear DA Katz's message. You do not need to suffer in violence. You are not alone. We are here to help. And we urge you to take advantage of the resources and the helpline. Uh, I believe we've answered just about all of the questions in the panel. I will send answers to anything that hasn't been answered yet. And if anyone needs to reach out, um, our contact numbers, our email addresses are all in the chat. Thank you all so much for uh, sharing this time with us. It truly was a great opportunity to speak to our Queens community. Thank you. Thank you.